six months into the pandemic, an Ohio-based cooperative network received an influx of requests from small businesses that wanted to turn themselves into worker-owned co-ops. For a lot of folks, they have been unhappy with how their current jobs, the current economy has been working for them. And the idea of being part of something truly holding workers as the most important piece is really, really attractive. That's Ellen Vera. She's the director of co-op organizing at Co-op Cincy, a network of around a dozen cooperative businesses in Cincinnati, Ohio, where workers manage, own, and ultimately share in the profits of their labor. Co-op Cincy has been around for about a decade, but in that fall of 2020 alone, it got applications to help another dozen businesses go co-op. One of the businesses that reached out was the Shine Nurture Center, a Montessori-style daycare next to the lush Mount Airy Forest in Cincinnati. As the pandemic dragged on, its founder and owner wanted to move on. Like many people, she was reevaluating her life and decided to go back to school. But she didn't want to shut down the center she'd built and run for the last six years. So she decided to sell it to the teachers who worked there. My name is Beth Pegg. I work here at Shine Nurture Center Cooperative, and I'm currently the office manager. We are a nature-based center, so we're mostly outside in Mount Airy. We're very lucky we have a path right out of our parking lot, so we get to go back there a lot with the kiddos. Beth is one of four teachers who went from working in the center to owning it. Before, she says, she was at the whims of administrators and parents, and at times found herself in less-than-ideal working conditions. Now, she's a business owner. She and the other teacher owners have a say in how things get run. That includes increasing pay and benefits and making sure classrooms aren't understaffed. And at the end of the year, she and the other owners will share in its profits, too. There's not a lot of, like, grumping about, like, why we're doing something because we all understand why we got to those steps. You can see why co-ops would be attractive during a pandemic that created enormous economic uncertainty. It gives people some power over their work lives, if they can work from home or take sick days or when they clock in and what they get paid. Looking at the childcare crisis, being an educator, there's just a lot of pressure put on childcare and there's not a lot of voice given to the folks who are in charge of it. So I think for post-pandemic, I think this might be a really good solution for teachers at centers who feel like they want to have a voice. Yet co-ops are still relatively rare in the U.S. Just around 100 people work at the companies in Co-op Cincy, for example. But there is somewhere where worker co-ops abound, and it's a place of notable equality. Mondragon is a group of around 100 cooperatives in the Basque region of Spain, that's been around for half a century. It covers nearly 80,000 workers across all sorts of industries. Nobody there is wildly rich, but there isn't much poverty either. It's the kind of place that often gets dismissed as a special place doing a special thing that can't be replicated elsewhere. But now, more and more, people are thinking maybe they can be the next Mondragon. Jobless claims coming in, I mean, really jumping from the week before. Pretty brutal, 3.2 million. A record 6.6 million Americans filed for unemployment last week. Indian working women were the worst impacted by the pandemic. Prices of public housing resale flats have hit an all-time high in the first quarter of this year. Well, now to the billionaire boom. According to Bloomberg, super yacht charters are up over 340%. And a billionaire was created every 26 hours during this pandemic. It is time for a wealth tax in America. Welcome back to The Paycheck. I'm Rebecca Greenfield. For the last seven weeks, we've gone around the world to see how the pandemic made things more or less equal. The answer depended on all sorts of variables. A country's pre-existing economic conditions, how it managed the virus itself, and what financial decisions were made facing a global economic crisis. In some places, there were some pleasant surprises. Like in the U.S., where the poorest got some stability and economic security for the first time in decades. 
In others, like India, economic desperation led people to make life-altering choices that derailed their futures. The question as we head into the next phase of the pandemic is how lasting will any of these trends be? That's what led us to worker-owned co-ops. Interest in worker-owned co-ops tends to spike during times of crisis. At a very basic level, worker co-ops, they tend to emerge where there's a market failure. That's Mike Palmieri, an associate researcher at the Ohio Employee Ownership Center at Kent State University. He says that people who feel left out of the economy seek out alternatives to traditional business models. After the 2008 recession, for example, he says the number of co-ops in the U.S. has more than doubled. To him, they're a key to closing wealth gaps. A lot of our inequality today is driven by inequality in wealth and assets. What employee ownership allows you to do is not just provide a higher wage via income, but it gives individuals who otherwise wouldn't have wealth and assets, wealth and assets, providing them that cushion and closing that gap as well. And so employee ownership kind of attacks, I would say, economic inequality at its root. While the pandemic isn't over yet, Mike says there's been a notable uptick in interest in the co-op model. People see it as a gateway to greater equality and security when the next pandemic or whatever crisis comes around. But how realistic is that? And how'd it work? My colleague Jeanette Newman went to the Basque region in Spain to visit the Mondragon co-ops, the mecca of worker cooperatives, to see how they fared during the pandemic and what lessons can be learned about creating a more equal world. Here she is with the story. I'm standing on an assembly line, watching some workers build washing machines. The company is called Fagor Industrial. It's one of the hundred or so cooperatives that are part of the Mondragon network. One of the workers on the assembly line is Baltasar Garcia Leon. Balta, as he's called, is 59 years old. He has a clean-shaven head and an athletic build, thanks to frequent outings with his cycling buddies. He's been building washing machines at Mondragon Cooperatives for more than three decades. He's telling me how the assembly line works. Balta and his colleagues on the line build 22 washing machines every day. They're sold to hotels and restaurants. When the pandemic hit, Balta's assembly line, like many around the world, downshifted. Every Friday they sent us home, so we missed out on a lot of hours. Balta and his colleagues also worked fewer hours on the days they went into the factory. Those were scary, uncertain times. Balta was worried about the virus, like everyone else. But he was less worried than many people about his paycheck and his savings. Thousands of workers at Mondragon felt the same. In those chaotic first months, as COVID-19 upended everything around the world, Mondragon was, by comparison, an oasis of calm for workers. The reason? Mondragon has a playbook to protect jobs that it's been honing for more than half a century. Mondragon's first cooperative was founded in the 1950s by a priest and some of his acolytes. Since then, crisis after crisis, the cooperatives have found a way to keep unemployment and inequality in check. The pandemic was no exception. When I go to other areas, I notice much greater social differences. Here, the manager can be my neighbor. Elsewhere, I guess they live in gated communities. Joblessness here is much lower than in the rest of Spain. And the level of income inequality is on par with countries such as Finland and Norway. The difference is that the Nordic countries have relatively high taxes. They redistribute wealth. In the Mondragon region, taxes are lower than in the Nordics. The cooperatives create wealth for a lot of people. One way they do that is by divvying up their annual profits among workers. Assembly line workers like Balta, for example, have retirement savings that are in line with top managers. The objective of the cooperative is not to produce rich people, it's to produce rich societies. At the end of the day, even if you are not rich, if you belong to a rich society, you will be happy. That's Igor Errarte. He works at Mondragon Assembly. It makes solar panels as well as machinery to help firms automate their production. Most of the cooperatives in the network are industrial. One of them is even making rocket parts for Blue Origin. That's the aerospace company owned by Jeff Bezos. 
As a rule, managers across the Mondrigo network can only earn six times more than the lowest paid worker. At some places, like Igor's cooperative, the gap is even smaller, three to one. Igor and many of his colleagues are engineers. They do similar work, he says, so they earn similar pay. Our societies here are very egalitarian. We don't have a lot of rich people or not very rich. But on the other hand, we also don't have poor people. The CEO or the engineer or the man who makes the photocopies, we all belong to the same social group. But how do those egalitarian ideals hold up when times get tough? How did the cooperatives and their worker owners survive the worst economic crisis in a century? I speak to Ander Echeverria. He's an executive at headquarters called Mondragon Corporation. The corporation oversees the 100 or so cooperatives that form part of the Mondragon network. When a crisis hits, all the co-ops rely on a safety net managed by headquarters. Ander says the goal is to preserve jobs and that means the safety net has to be flexible. For that, we have different mechanisms. If there is no work for me in my cooperative, I have the right to work in another cooperative of the corporation. If there is no work for me in the corporation, I have the right to be trained, to be more employable. And if still there is no work for me in the corporation, I have the right to get an unemployment benefit for maximum two years. This is great. That does sound great, and Ander makes it seem so easy. But the cooperative model doesn't always work perfectly. About a decade ago, the co-op where Balta was working went bankrupt. It was in the aftermath of the global recession. That was a wake-up call for Balta and many others. Failure is possible. So even when things appeared to be running smoothly at Mondragon during the pandemic, in the back of workers' minds, the threat of failure loomed. I visit Balta at his apartment to learn more about how he survived that bankruptcy and the pandemic. He lives just outside the town of Mondragon. The area is surrounded by forested mountaintops, which give way to pastures and farmland. Further down, in the narrow mountain valleys, sit boxy industrial warehouses where the cooperatives manufacture their products. I ring Balta's doorbell. Si, hola Balta. We sit down at his kitchen table. He proudly points to a white washing machine from his cooperative, tucked underneath the countertop. Balta joined his first co-op in 1990. He worked there for more than two decades. In 2013, it went bankrupt after struggling through Spain's double-dip recession. Balta and around 1,900 other workers lost their jobs. It was the biggest crisis the cooperatives had ever faced. Of course, I was scared. I had done an interview or two at that time, but I mean, I was 48 years old. I was already pretty old. I thought it was going to be difficult. But Mondragon eventually found new jobs at other cooperatives for most of the workers, including Balta. He got a position at Fagor Industrial, where he is now. Other workers went into early retirement. Still, the bankruptcy meant that Balta and other members lost the money they had been stashing away for years in their retirement savings accounts. That was a lesson for everyone at Mondragon. When a crisis hits, workers have to react quickly to shore up the finances of their cooperatives and prevent things from getting worse. During the pandemic, Balta and his colleagues tried to put that lesson into practice. In the U.S. and other countries, unemployment spiked in the early days of the pandemic. Business slowed down or came to a halt, and executives had to cut costs, so they laid off workers. Balta and other cooperative members are workers and owners, So it wasn't an option for them to fire themselves. But they still had to find a way to cut costs. Otherwise, they could end up saving themselves, but tanking the cooperative. It is in our interest in every respect that the cooperative does well. Our livelihood depends on Fagor Industrial. So making money, that has to be the baseline. Because a company can have a really nice financial target, but if it doesn't earn any money in the end, it's gone. It would be destroyed. This is where Mondragon's crisis playbook kicks in. The leadership team, which is made up of assembly line workers like Balta and members who have more executive experience, met to make a plan. First, they decided to lay off a few dozen workers who aren't members of the cooperative. Only around one third of workers at Mondragon are also members. Some people don't qualify. New members have to be voted in by existing members. 
If someone has a reputation as being a bit irresponsible or isn't considered a team player, they might not be accepted. Others don't want to pay the roughly $16,000 it costs to become a member. That's a kind of down payment to join the cooperative. It goes into a savings fund for the worker. Next, Balta's co-op trim salaries. On days they didn't work, which ended up being more than anticipated, they would get 80% of their salaries. We missed a lot of hours. We couldn't recover a lot of those hours. How did the co-op afford to pay Balta and his colleagues for all those days they didn't work? After all, revenue had fallen. Mondragon headquarters stepped in and tapped a kind of insurance program it has. Co-ops that were doing well, such as those producing medical gear and bicycles, transferred funds to co-ops like Balta's, where workers had missed a lot of days. Ander, the Mondragon executive we spoke to earlier, explains. That mechanism we applied for 9,000 workers in the pandemic year, and it had a cost of 13.2 million euros. So when we are talking about solidarity, it is also about money. Anders' comments should dispel any images you might have in your mind of the cooperatives as a kind of utopian commune in the Spanish countryside. Ander and others at Mondragon talk about money and profits with the same ease as any capitalist. The co-ops are, first and foremost, a business. They need to be profitable. At a publicly traded company, the goal is to return profits to shareholders. The goal of the cooperatives, by contrast, is to be profitable in order to create and maintain good jobs. Another big difference is how the cooperatives share their profits. Bolt and the other worker owners decide that. We gather at an annual general assembly, and that's where a lot of the important issues are presented and are voted on by all the members. Ahead of the annual meeting, the leadership team comes up with a proposal to raise, lower, or maintain salaries. They also come up with a plan for profit sharing. Then, the leadership team briefs workers, hashing out any disagreements at meetings and around the water cooler. Finally, they all vote. Advocates of worker cooperatives often emphasize the importance of one worker, one vote. That means each member's vote has the same weight. Balta says the phrase gives people an idealized impression of what actually happens at the annual meetings. It's ultimately the manager who's in charge. I mean, it's very nice to say from the outside that we are represented. I feel qualified to make decisions at my own job, but not at the company level. While Balta doesn't want to be responsible for setting company strategy, he does value having a say in how the company is run. And if workers aren't happy with the leadership team, they can vote them out. I am part of that company. I make decisions. I vote yes or I vote no. The annual meetings aren't without conflict. Some tensions always emerge when hundreds of people are deciding what to pay themselves. As people around Mondragon like to say, this is not paradise and we're not angels. Last year, Balta and some colleagues voted against a proposal to increase executive pay. While salary differences in Mondragon are minimal by global standards, Balta worries the increases are a slippery slope to greater inequality. I think the differences are getting bigger, and that's what bothers me. I understand that a qualified person has to be paid, but maybe a different system has to be found. In the end, the salary increase went through. Balta is still frustrated about that. But that's democracy, he says. Your candidate doesn't always win. Think for a minute about an average U.S. company. Then think about a majority of employees at that company voting to cut their salaries during a crisis. It seems like a long shot, right? Some employees would probably say, well, I performed well, or my division is thriving, so why should I take a hit? That's different from how workers at Mondragon and other worker cooperatives think about salary cuts. They're also the owners, so a salary cut helps to ensure the survival of their company. It's about shared ownership. Mike Palmieri, the Kent State co-op expert we spoke to earlier, explains. There's this democratic component that makes worker cooperatives so much different than just owning a share in a company. Every person gets one vote, regardless of how long they've been there. 
So it's detached from capital. And at the same level, the way that the profits are distributed at the end of the year are based on hours worked. And so it's very equitable. It might seem a little surprising, but if people have a stake in the business doing well, they're going to care more. If you work at a company where the company does great and it does absolutely nothing for your life, who cares? Whereas where you have a real stake, where you will really benefit, people tend to call out sick a lot less at employee-owned companies. People tend to have a much different relationship with management at employee-owned companies. They're more likely to say something. And they're more likely to look at their coworker and say, hey, you're kind of slacking, you know, can let's, let's do something here. And- the co-ops that are part of the Mondrigo network are just a fraction of the thousands of co-ops located all across the Basque region of Spain. Worker co-ops have flourished in this part of the world, in part because shared ownership is an important part of the culture. That's different than in the U.S. Co-op Cincy told us they have to hold classes on how to build a culture of solidarity. But in the Basque region, the benefits and responsibilities of owning something with a group of people are almost second nature to many. People around here uphold these values even when they're having fun. One evening, I joined Ander, the co-op executive, for dinner. We walk through the town of Mondragon. Its narrow streets are lined with old stone buildings. We are going to go to a club, a Basque traditional culinary club, Choco Sociedad Gastronomica. They are a place to be with your friends, colleagues, family. And today, for example, in the town of Mondragon, we are 22,000 inhabitants and we have 22 clubs. Culinary clubs are essentially a private restaurant that's collectively owned and run by a group of acquaintances. The club votes to elect new members, and everyone pays a membership fee. We walk down some stairs and come into a big room that looks like a restaurant with long wooden tables. Some of Ander's friends await us, including Kepoliden, a journalist and a fantastic chef. He's prepared a dish traditional in nearby San Sebastian. Hake, white asparagus, hard-boiled eggs and clams in a white wine sauce. He also sizzles up some ribeye steaks, and we have some red wine. At culinary clubs, you can find a CEO of a company and an assembly line worker at the same table. All members pay the same fee and have equal access to a professional kitchen and spacious dining room. That's a major perk in this food-obsessed region. Around here, people tend to live in apartments where kitchens aren't particularly big. Also, there aren't a lot of restaurants in many of the small towns. Many of the culinary club members and the workers at Mondragon were born and raised nearby. This culture of shared ownership is in their blood. That culture, though, can sometimes feel exclusionary to outsiders. Que me gustaría a mí más. What would I like most of all? I'd like to see more people who are representative of the whole society in the cooperatives. That's Diego Montoya. He's originally from Colombia. Diego says he would like to see more Colombians, Ecuadorians, Senegalese, and others who weren't born in the area, but who were part of Basque society, join the cooperatives. About 20 years ago, Diego left his native Colombia. Guerrilla groups such as the FARC were fighting the government. When Diego and his sister arrived in the Basque region, they had to sleep on the streets. Eventually, Diego found work as a waiter, then in construction. But he wanted a job at one of the cooperatives, so he decided to get his engineering degree. After a decade in Mondragon, when he was nearly 40, he finally became a member. Logra una estabilidad que te da y paz mental. I've reached a place of stability which gives me peace of mind. And also, I'm not worried that at my age, they're going to fire me. They're not going to fire me. Diego wants more people like himself to be able to experience the benefits of Mondragon's cooperatives. He says that one hurdle is that some of the co-ops strongly encourage members to speak the Basque language, Euskera. While he appreciates that the language is an important part of Basque identity, he doesn't want it to be a barrier to entry. Diego's wife, Maria Bertegui, has co-ops in her blood. She grew up in the town of Mondragon, and her father was an important figure in the early cooperative movement. I'm speaking to both of them at a small weekend home that Maria's family owns. 
It's a short drive from Mondragon. We're sitting outside and have a great view of the Basque Mountains in the distance. Miles and miles of green. They, they would get together, all of them, to, to help one of the farms, you know, like also land means uh, neighborhood work. Yeah. Maria's head of customer service at Orbea, a Mondragon co-op that makes bicycles. It's a well-known brand in Spain and among cyclists globally. When the pandemic struck, many of Orbea's clients, bicycle shops around the world, shut down. Maria says Orbea decided to act to avoid pushing its clients into bankruptcy. When restrictions started to lift, demand for bicycles surged. Orbea has had a great couple of years. I asked Maria if she and her colleagues voted to boost their salaries as a result. No. We are quite conservative in that sense. And we are very aware of the cycles. Orbea was uh, founded in 1840. So I guess they passed a lot of bad things, a lot of good things. And so whenever we, it's going very well, they, we always get like, okay, just in case. We get this money just in case. And we put, you know, all the just in case boxes full. <laughs> because we know that, you know, bad things come. Maria says the stability of the cooperative is the stability of hundreds of people's livelihoods. You are playing with many people's money. <laughs> That's something that it makes you think twice. In general, Europe was a relatively stable place for many workers during the pandemic. Spain and other countries rolled out national furlough programs. They subsidized the salaries of tens of millions of employees who couldn't work. The difference is that the scale of these programs was new. There were major growing pains. Some workers didn't get their furlough payments for months, for example. At Mondragon, there were no growing pains during the pandemic. Their crisis playbook is tried and tested. Back in Balta's kitchen, he tells me how his co-op has been doing. In May of this year, Balta and the other members of his cooperative gathered for their annual meeting. Demand for washing machines has been picking up. Fagor reported a profit. Workers increased their salaries by about 5%, and they voted to distribute some of those profits to members. Each member got the equivalent of thousands of dollars deposited in a savings fund. My experience has been very positive. The worst that could happen to me happened. I lost my job when I was 48, 50 years old. Now I'm 59 years old and I'm still working and I've held on to everything I've fought for. I've held on to it. Not everywhere can be like Mondragon. But it's become a kind of North Star for places like Co-op Sensi. That's what Kristen Barker, one of the other founders of the Co-op Network, told me. On issues like inequality, I think there's just a tendency to throw up our hands and feel like we can't really do anything on here. But you look at Mondragon, a living, breathing proven model of extraordinary progress. This is possible, and this is what we want to be about creating. The pandemic has led to unimaginable devastation and trauma. But it has also shown that there are proven models that create greater equality. Whether it's the co-ops of Mondragon, or giving people cash like in the U.S., or the power of community-based programs like in Kenya. There are things that work. It's now up to us to decide if we'll learn any of those lessons. This is our last episode of this season of The Paycheck. Last week's episode said that Singapore has no manufacturing sector. We have corrected the error as the category now accounts for 20% of its GDP. Thank you so much for listening. If you like our show, please head on over to Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts to rate and review. This episode was hosted by me, Rebecca Greenfield, and reported by Jeanette Newman and me. It was edited by Danielle Balbi and me with help from Francesca Levy, Janet Paskin, and Rakshita Saluja. We also had editing help from Shelley Banjo, Kristen B. Brown, Jill DiCarli, Nicole Flato, Alyssa McDonald, and Kai Schultz. This episode was produced by Jill DiCarli and sound engineered by Matt Kime. Our original music is by Leo Sidrin. The voice actors you heard were Alex Marrero and Juan Carlos Hernandez. Special thanks to Magnus Henriksen, McKinnon de Kuyper, Margaret Sutherland, and Stacey Wong. Francesca Levy is Bloomberg's head of podcasts.